This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine. Plus, global business, finance, and tech news. The Bloomberg Business Week podcast with Carol Messer and Tim Stenebeck from Bloomberg Radio. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the weekend edition of Bloomberg Business Week. Ahead on the program, we'll take you inside the human brain as Elon Musk's Neuralink gets FDA clearance to start implanting computer chips in people's skulls. All the company needs now is some volunteers. What could go wrong? We'll also discuss another long-term Musk goal, Human Life on Mars. A new book lays out the potential pros and cons, there are quite a few of them, of colonizing space. Plus, we're going to get a pulse check on geopolitics with Brookings Institution Senior Fellow Angela Stent as Russia and Ukraine approach a grim milestone, with much of the world now focused on Israel's war against Hamas. All of that to come, we begin with one of the U.S. economy's most important components. We're, of course, talking about the housing market. This week, we saw the average 30-year mortgage rate fall by the most in more than a year to 7.61%. That helped spark the biggest advance in home purchase applications since early June. Still, affordable housing is hard to come by, and that's largely due to a phenomenon called the lock-in effect. It's the subject of a recent Bloomberg Business Week cover story. And for more, we go to the Bloomberg News real estate reporting team of Prashant Gopal and Patrick Clark, along with the editor of the magazine, Joel Weber. Look, ultimately, if you want to feel like there's an existential crisis in the U.S., I think the housing industry, housing market is a, maybe a pretty good one, good place to look right now. If you have one of those low rate mortgages and a lot of people do that a lot of people got fortunate enough to get in when the market allowed that you don't want to give it up so there's very little incentive to sell and then have to take out a high mortgage now that also means that for those people who never had a chance to get in you're not able to get in because nobody's selling there's very low inventory and if you could get in, you have to pay that 8% mortgage that is potentially, you know, dramatically higher than what the housing market even looked like two years ago. And boy, that is just a rotten place to be. Mm -hmm. And especially for um, people who are starting out, it really feels like you're just iced out. Um, and that has, I think, some long-term economic implications for the U.S. Uh, and there, I think we're done talking about the story because that's basically how <laughs> rotten this is. But there's a whole lot more there. there um, and Prashant and Pat Clark did a great job of, of not only setting that table. And and this is, to me, one of these stories that when I first started engaging with them about it, it feels like one of the most important stories of the year. We've talked about what hap what's happened in the commercial real estate right. world. This is equally scary because it affects people so directly, I think. Um, so, Prashant, you got to speak to some people. Tell us about what you and Pat learned along the way. Well, really, this is like uh, two different worlds, right? So people who own houses are, are really the haves here. And um, in some ways, they're sitting pretty because they, they, they locked in some of the lowest rates in history. And uh, they're unaffected for the most uh, part by the uh, rising mortgage rates because you know most people have fixed rate mortgages for you know 30 years. So um, they might be in those homes for a long time because they have very little, very little incentive to sell um, and take on sort of a much higher rate. On the other hand, um, people who haven't gotten a chance to buy yet, Maybe they were, you know, they couldn't buy during the peak of the COVID buying frenzy um, because they lost out in bidding wars. Uh, but now they can't buy because they can't afford to. The the you combine these very high prices and these uh, extraordinarily high rates, and um, you know they're they're just locked out. You remind us of an economist back in the 1980s who actually identified this so-called lock-in effect. Take us back there because we've kind of been in these this position before. It was very much like what we're seeing now, which is that interest rates shot up quickly and uh, people who, you know, in, in, I think between 1978 and 1981 interest rates doubled. They were much higher in those days. I think they shot up all the way, I think, to 18% or so. Um, but interest rates went up very quickly. And it became clear that the old mortgage 
had a value attached to it, right? It, it wasn't just the bill you had to pay every month, but it was worth you know thousands of dollars. And because if you were to trade it into a new mortgage, that's how much more you would pay over the life of a loan. And you know, at the time, there was a uh, an economist at the University of California who who you know who sort of showed that this was correlated or or he associated this with a strong disincentive to move. Um, which is is logical. Um, you know, you fast forward now to today, and there uh, the, there are two researchers, one at, at University of Illinois and one at the University of Pennsylvania, who actually you know have a a you know a, a way to do a sort of back of the envelope calculation to to show um, that there's a real causal effect between this you know lock in effect and uh reduced residential mobility people are going to move less and in fact people have been moving less in america you know for but we quite were a while finally but moving, could... we were finally moving again right with the pandemic because <laughs> you could work joel anywhere like finally people were starting to move around again a little bit and boy did that end with the <laughs> pandemic right and and now suddenly you, maybe even you worse. did move somewhere and now you know even being able to offload that thing that you got yourself into uh, maybe you won't be so lucky now. Um, yeah. Now, most important question I'm going to ask today, Pat Prashant, which of you got to speak to Eugene Quackenbush? <laughs> I love Sounds that like name. Both. I, I, I always, I, I spoke to Eugene. Okay, so tell us about... Uh, also, can we say the name of Eugene Quackenbush? Quackenbush. Brokerage. Uh, get your Bro nest. Brokerage. He get knows your exactly nest. what he's doing. Phoenix Come area on. brokerage. Like, Come on. Does it get any better than that? I, I know Pat has a deep understanding of Phoenix, but tell us about what, what Mr. Quackenbush Is it reveals. really his name yeah, and his company? Yeah. All right, all right. Okay, but 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 he's a you know he's a pretty savvy real estate guy in, um, in, in Phoenix who has a, a real estate company called get your nest that will that that, that, that acts as a, a brokerage and the types of you know effectively he has to get creative for his clients and, and and the simplest thing is you go and look for a new home right because the 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 home builders are often buying down interest rates and 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 we can tell you more about that or Prashant can tell you more about that but he's doing things as well like well can we go out and find people who have assumable mortgages which is usually uh an FHA or a VA loan that someone else can take on. So, you know, it was a, there's a 3% mortgage and you sell the mortgage along with the house. It's a package deal. At the end deal. of the day. Right there. <laughs> package deal. It's yeah. not just, it's yeah, not just not better. the uh, garden, you know, yeah. furniture Who, that you're throwing get, in. Yeah, I'll throw in the 3% mortgage. I mean, it sounds like a great deal. You know, and it's probably better than the alternatives because the alternatives are you either look for something smaller or what you find is a house that's not in great condition. And so not only is it expensive, it's going to need more work or another thing that that Eugene told me he was doing with clients or, you know, clients were considering is, you know, you just drive farther. It's mm. it's no longer, mm. you know, the close in suburb that you pictured yourself in in 2021 when all your friends were uh, rushing to buy homes. You are now. You know, you're now in the next or the the, the one after, and um, you're having to drive farther every day. Oh, so, so, Prashant, let's talk about the home builder dynamic, because the other thing here is that there just hasn't been that much inventory, right? But like, so where are the home builders in all of this? Right. So the home builders, uh, in some ways, are in much better shape because uh, they produce inventory. Uh, so you've had the existing market just completely lock up. Um, and that's left a little bit of an opening, especially for the larger builders that have their own mortgage arms. So they're able to kind of um, offer subsidized uh, mortgage rates, um, which are really enticing buyers to, to buy new. So they, they they're can more aggressively cut prices and you know offer you know a five percent mortgage or something like that. At least for a period of time, it can you know it might it might increase later, but for the first few years, five percent. Um, and that's that's actually working for them. So they're able to sort of increase production and get more buyers in. Okay, so young people can't get in. People with low rate mortgages don't want to sell. What's the way out of this impossible mess? Well, we had we had like uh, we spoke with uh, you know Ralph McLaughlin. He's a he's an economist. Um, so there there've been some efforts to sort of attack this from. Uh, from the perspective of demand, trying to get uh, make it easier for people to purchase, right? So lowering fees 
for mortgages, things like that, down payment assistance. But all that does is sort of adds to the competition, right? Which is the problem we have. So his idea is let's try to get convinced sellers to sell. So he's suggesting that you could do things like um, a window of time where you know capital gains, where maybe investors wouldn't have to pay that, um, or 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 you you increase um, taxes on rental uh, landlords. Um, either way, the idea would be to get some of these Airbnb landlords and, and other landlords to sell to first-time buyers. Our thanks to Prashant Gopal and Patrick Clark with Bloomberg News. That full interview is available on our podcast feed, and their story is, of course, available online at Bloomberg.com as well as on the Bloomberg Terminal. Joel Weber is going to be back with us next hour. Coming up as the Israel-Hamas war intensifies, another violent conflict is dragging on in Europe. The war seems to be at this moment in a dynamic stalemate. How Vladimir Putin could use the world's focus on Gaza to his advantage against Ukraine. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern. Listen on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. From Wall Street to the World Bank, one risk towers above all, and that is geopolitical. Uh, We know um, Israel has talked about its troops entering the middle of Gaza's main city as they continue their offensive against Hamas. EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen weighing in, saying Israel will have to leave Gaza eventually. And then, of course, Tim, there's the war between Russia and Ukraine. Yeah, well into its second year, almost its third year. Ukraine President Zelensky welcoming a decision by the European Union's executive arm to back a start to membership talks with Kyiv pledging to continue work to develop state institutions. A lot for the world to manage, and we've got a great guest, Carol. Angela Stemp back with us, senior fellow at Brookings Institution, author of Putin's World, former national intelligence officer for Russia and Eurasia. She worked at the U.S. State Department. She's back with us on Zoom from Washington. Um, Angela, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Is the world making what feels like a mistake, and to some extent it feels like they're forgetting about the Russian war in Ukraine? Well, certainly the conflict in the Middle East has diverted attention from the war in Ukraine, but that war goes on. Russia destroyed um, a, I guess it was a Liberian flagged ship in the port of Odessa, killing the pilot. Um, It's been attacking Ukrainian infrastructure. Uh, The Ukrainians are fighting valiantly back, but uh, the war seems to be at this moment in a dynamic stalemate. Um, And the Ukrainians, you know, continue to need assistance from from the West, particularly from the United States. And of course, that's up for question at the moment. It is up for question, but so far the United States has pledged and given quite a bit of aid to the Ukrainians. Are you concerned? I mean, I guess if you were a decision maker in Washington, would you? how much would you, like what would you need to see in order to, for you to say, okay, that's enough aid for Ukraine? Well, I I think we have to continue supporting them. Um, If we don't send them more assistance and more weapons, it's going to be much harder for them to push back against the Russians. I think there'll be probably somewhat of a lull in the fighting in the winter, even though some of these attacks will go on. But we know that in the spring, the the fighting will start up again, and we need to equip the Ukrainians so that they can continue uh, to try and push back the Russians. But but if it's a stalemate, then... What's the motivation for, and forgive me because we're talking about, you know, we have to remember this is people. This is people, yeah. Yeah. But a lot of that gets lost, I think, in the conversation when members of Congress are, are talking about budgets and there there's a lot of tension with providing aid to Ukraine. And there has been for more than two years at this point. How do lawmakers justify continuing to send aid if it's just a continued stalemate? Well, uh, first of all, it's in our national interest not to have Russia win this war. If Russia succeeds in subduing Ukraine, uh, if that's not where Russia is going to stop, it'll probably set its sights um, further west including possibly, if you read some of the things that were published today, uh, written by the former President Medvedev, it cites on Poland. Uh, And the U.S. doesn't want, you know, we don't have any uh, boots on the ground there. 
our uh, men and women aren't dying for this, but it's in our interest to make sure that we don't get sucked into another even bigger war in Europe um, if we don't support Ukraine, um, you know, as it fights back. Well, and this is where, you know, we so wanted to have you back because it was understandably, you understand why in the past month our, our we have shifted our focus. It feels like as a world, you know, how much stress can we geopolitically focus on? Both situations are dire and important, uh, but we have shifted to what's going on between Israel and Hamas at this point. But I wanted you to come back on for us to understand um, Vladimir Putin and what his goals are here with what he is trying to do. It doesn't necessarily stop with Ukraine, correct? That's correct. I mean, he's first of all believes that he can wait this out. Um, he can, the war will go on in 2024. Russia has more men that it can send um, as cannon fodder uh, than Ukraine does. Uh, it has a, three times the population and they're getting, you know, ammunition now from North Korea. We know that they're getting drones from Iran. So he wants to wait this out and hope that someone enters the White House in 2025 who will say enough, we don't want to support Ukraine anymore or that there'll be Ukraine fatigue maybe in some European countries. So he's waiting for Western resolve to collapse, which it remarkably hasn't yet. Um, but his, again, his goals don't stop at Ukraine. Uh, they, it, there might be a pause. Uh, mm -hmm. He wouldn't, you know, Russia wouldn't immediately then turn its sights on another country. But in the longer run, as long as he's in power and he's running for re-election uh, next year and he will surely get re-elected, as long as he's in power, those aims, I think, aren't going to change. So he has enough men. Does he have enough money? I mean, can he break his country, Vladimir Putin, in his fight, his conquest of Ukraine? He has enough money. I mean, the Russians are still making money on selling oil and gas, uh, you know, despite all of the uh, sanctions and everything. They they are making money from the hydro hydrocarbon sales. Um, their uh, economy is set to grow, predicted to grow, in fact, um, I think by about 2% next year. They've recovered a bit and um, the economy is doing better than it was before. So they can continue this fight. That's that's what's so surprising to me. I mean, we spoke to you, Angela, early on mm -hmm. in the and we've been speaking to you throughout the mm -hmm. conflict. But yeah. the, the general consensus was this was going to be quick and it's been anything but quick. Um, how do you think this war ends as we approach the third year? Right. Well, it's you know, this, this is the sixty four thousand dollar question that everyone is asking. I mean, at some point it might be that both sides recognize that neither of them are going to achieve their full aims and that they do sit down and negotiate. Um, that's still what we want to avoid is another frozen conflict, mm -hmm. uh, which is to have some kind of agreement, but which is really only temporary and an agreement that would involve Ukraine unless it makes more progress territorial. It would territorially, it would lose some more territory. Um, that might end the fighting. Uh, you could have a ceasefire, you could end the fighting. Right. Uh, but that's not a longer term solution to this. Um, you know, the, uh, um, you know the, the desired solution would be obviously for Russia to withdraw its troops and to renounce uh, the, you know, territorial claims on these areas that it claims to have annexed, but which it doesn't fully control. Right. Uh, but that, that may take much longer. So it probably would be, you know, in the short run at least, some kind of a ceasefire and a temporary solution to this. A longer term solution is much harder to envisage. Yeah, you do wonder if even in some kind of resolution, ceasefire, any territory win on the behalf of uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin is just going to incite him to continue on his quest. That was Angela Stent, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Still ahead on Bloomberg Business Week, Carol and I head to New Orleans for the inaugural Wells Fargo Black Business Leaders Summit where the lender is looking to make good on its promise to underserved Americans after striking a partnership with an influential black community leader. So we can't take it all on. Right. But piece by piece, we can begin to make the kind of 
uh, statistical differences, measurable uh, metrics on differences with KPIs that we both agree on as to how we can further move, uh, close the digital divide, close the divide with housing and home ownership, close the divide with economic literacy. Bishop T.D. Jakes, chairman of the T.D. Jakes Group, on his organization's pact with Wells Fargo, and how it could help drive economic vitality and inclusivity in communities across the country. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business app, and YouTube. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. strategic partnership to build inclusive communities. This follows reporting and analysis by Bloomberg and others, and we're just laying out the landscape on Wells Fargo having a really bad record when it comes um, uh, among major lenders when it comes to refinancing by black homeowners, which is why we are very interested in how these two got together and what their goals are all about. Here with more is Christy Furcho. She's head of diverse segments, representation and inclusion at Wells Fargo and T.D. Jakes. He's chairman of the T.D. Jakes group here in New Orleans. And welcome, welcome. Thank um, you. So good to have the two of you here with us. Um, Tell us, first of all, um, Christy, about this summit. And I'm curious, I want to get from both of you. I always feel like when something like this is created, there were some really meaningful conversations ahead of it. So tell us from your perspective, maybe about some of the tough conversations that had to be had. It's over a year in the making. We have been having conversations about getting black leaders together to really continue to focus on what needs to happen in these black communities, in black and brown communities, to really advance what we're doing around racial equity and really advancing home ownership, small business, entrepreneurship. And so this summit really represents the possibility of what we can do together when you put collective minds in the space together and say, what can we do together? How can we help advance what's important to these communities? Chairman Jakes, come on in on this conversation because we certainly talked with you a lot throughout the pandemic um, after the murder of George Floyd. And we talked about just the injustices that were out there in society and how it was long overdue for initiatives to happen and the conversations it couldn't be just talk anymore. What were some of the conversations that you guys had, that you had with Wells Fargo about, all right, if we're going to do this partnership, this is what it's got to really be about and the actions that needed to be taken? It's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to explore a multi-pronged solution uh, with companies like Wells Fargo uh, that they would understand their fiduciary responsibility to extend themselves to the community that they live in and not just the customer themselves because they're inextricably connected. And the more you understand that the well-meaning of the client has a lot to do with the well-meaning of your own business, these types of conversations emerge organically. So not only with this company, but with several companies, people are starting to rethink uh, their responsibility, their stewardship to the community. And then uh, because companies have the evaluation of ESG and social impact, and they don't spend their day-to-day making a living doing social impact, partnerships like ours emerge to help them facilitate that social impact while they continue to do the business that's necessary and the community benefits because they are exposed to capital relationships that are necessary to move the community forward. So, And that's actually a key point he just made, which is this reach into the community. Historically, these communities don't have trust of large banks or financial institutions. And so by partnering with partners like TD Jakes, we get reach in the community where they've got trust. They've got the relationship. And they actually know the community. And they know the community. We we were talking about as we walked around, like you really, you can see some of the issues that, that need to be, you know, 
dealt with and helped, if you will. Absolutely. And that's why these partnerships are critical because we can go into those communities. We can understand on the ground what are the issues and then how do we bring real solutions. So what are some of the issues, I think one of the important things for our association and our partnership, there are many, many issues, but one of the things about our partnership that's very interesting we're not on the retail end of the business as it relates to pushing mortgages to people on the street. We're on the back end community development so that people will have an opportunity to choose the vehicle of their choice. That's the first thing that's important to understand. We determine that housing, not only for underserved communities, but every major city in the country is facing serious problems with workforce housing, mixed income housing, mm -hmm. Uh, creates the best sociological atmospheres. Their education is an issue. Technology is an issue. So we can't take it all on. Right. But piece by piece, we can begin to make the kind of uh, statistical differences with KPIs that we both agree on as to how we can further move, uh, close the digital divide, close the divide with economic literacy. This is, I think, my third time to New Orleans, um, was here after the financial crisis, and it was all about how do we bring back the U.S. economy. Um, here after Katrina and still seeing the devastation, talk to us about what's going on in the New Orleans community that maybe the rest of the country isn't so aware of. Everybody goes about their day-to-day, -day, what's in front of them, but there are some cities that are definitely struggling and could use certainly an assist. Uh, I can only go by what I've read about New Orleans. I don't live here, <clears throat> but I have read some very interesting things. These are not street people in the street. These are working people who can no longer afford to live in their house that are literally raising their children on the sidewalk for the first time. So we have a tendency to drive by homeless people and think that they're monolithic. But a lot of people that are entering into this phase are coming in as immigrants from the outside of uh, the homeless system for the very first time. And the trauma associated with it is devastating. Here's the other thing. They're working people. Right. They're working people who can no longer afford the escalating rents that are perpetuating themselves all over the United States and, quite honestly, globally. Well, let's go down that because I feel like, Christy, we've been talking about the unaffordable aspect of housing for a long time. A long time. I've been doing this a long time. You're right. And it's been this chronic, and it feels like it's just and it's getting, getting worse. worse. And it's getting worse. So, so how do you guys in this partnership go about fixing some of that? Well, there's a couple of things that we're really focused on at Wells Fargo. I mean, one of the things that we did is the worth initiative, right? Wealth ownership um, through home ownership and really focused on eight cities. We partnered with nonprofits and we said, we'll give you a grant. Help us solve this problem in your cities. And we uh, awarded in eight cities $7.5 million with the idea that we would be $60 million over um, the life of this grant. And we would create 40,000 new homeowners with real solutions on the ground in these communities. So that's one way to start is partnering with people on the ground that understand the issue in their community and really try to drive that forward. It's about supply, which is a significant issue, right? Mm -hmm. You can't build more mm -hmm. dirt. The dirt right. is the dirt. And so what are the solutions to be able to get people um, in? And so it's about affordable supply. It's about looking for real solutions that are going to continue to get people in. And so we've got a commercial you know, real estate um, deficit, especially with office and the community um, kind of post-COVID. How do you retrofit some of that for affordable housing and really partner with the government to be able to get some of those um, office buildings retrofit. Easier so that said becomes than done, as we've Easier said than done, as we know. Sure. I mean, yeah. we, we've talked about well, the challenges. Well, but Christy, it start to be about solutions, though. You've got to start with the conversation to see if you can really make some traction. We're talking a significant investment from Wells Fargo, potentially over the next 10 years. The partnership could result in up to a billion dollars in capital and financing from Wells Fargo. That's real money. That's real money. Um, how do you measure success? Give us some metrics here to make sure that 
you know, our audience knows what's successful and also the investment community knows what's successful. Well, those are the KPIs that Chairman Jake's talked about. I mean, it's really about how many homeowners are we are actually creating. On the development side, it's as looking at mixed use. Are we bringing developers to the table to help in the development of these communities? It's about inclusive communities and really looking at the number of people that, that we're serving in that. And so, um, you know, we'll, as we continue to develop the project, we'll look to what some of those key KPIs will be, but that's the conversation we continue to have, which is these have to have real metrics that we can point to in terms of the lives that we change through this project. Our thanks to Christy Furcho of Wells Fargo and T.D. Jakes, chairman of the T.D. Jakes Group. They joined us in New Orleans this past week at the first ever Wells Fargo Black Business Leader Summit. You can catch the full conversation on our podcast feed. We're going to have more from our trip to the Big Easy next hour. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Up next, as one group tries to claim its rightful seat at the table of America's financial system, another says it's time to flip the table over. Why young Americans are increasingly down on capitalism and what one millennial journalist thinks is a better alternative. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern. Listen on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. Well, as I was preparing for our next guest, Carol, I found some fascinating data from the Pew Research Center. Get this. Only 40% of Americans who are ages 18 to 29 view capitalism positively. This is from a 2022 Pew survey. It was done in August of 2022. Mm. So that 40% is a low when it comes to age groups, and it's more than 30 percentage points lower than those who are 65 and older. It doesn't surprise me. It doesn't surprise me. Do you have a favorable view of capitalism? Don't you feel like you have conversations with younger individuals, and they're like, capitalism, not good. Yeah, I do. Um, And sometimes they outgrow it, and sometimes they don't. Well, you laid out some statistics, right? And the demographic differences don't stop there. There are differences among white, black, Hispanic, and Asian Americans with respect to how they feel about capitalism. So I'm guessing our next guest is going to have some thoughts about this. Malaika Jabali is the author of a new book, It's Not You, It's Capitalism, Why It's Time to Break Up and How We Move On. She's also senior news and politics editor at Essence Magazine. She joins us on Zoom from Atlanta. Malaika, how are you? Hi, I'm well. How are you? We're doing well, thanks. Congratulations on the new book. Um, it's Thank you. This is not just, you know, we say book, but it's like not just like any other book. I mean, no. this has got some great illustrations in it. It's got some uh, really cool charts. It's got some Drake in there as well. Uh, it's <laughs> you, awesome. You keep that. Great. It's, it's yeah. very, very cool. It's digestible, cool. too. Like, it is totally the digestible. kind of lay it out. But I want to know about capitalism. What drew you to uh, questioning capitalism? Well, you guys kind of hinted at it. It was a lot of things. I had a foundation in these organizations and movements in the South of all places where Black people were questioning it. If you look at where our economy really uh, was founded upon in the South and really the entire country, it was based on Black labor. It was based on free Black labor. And that is how we have capitalism today. And so you had these groups in the South who were looking at our role in this entire system. And we just haven't seen any system. We haven't seen it thrive without that kind of exploitation, even if you look you know, beyond uh, the slave trade, if you look beyond plantation slavery. So that was sort of underpinning, I, I think, just my being open to be critical of the system. But I'm a millennial. Like, I lived in New York City. I was studying securities regulation of all things um, at Columbia Law School. I was studying primarily at the School of Social Work at Columbia. But literally, the class was about looking at the financial crisis where we got diverted from the core syllabus because Wall Street was falling apart. So we were reading newspaper article after newspaper article. It really became more like a doom scrolling, you know, newspaper (laughs) session, but it wasn't scrolling at the time. We're flipping through the pages about all these financial industries that were just going um, underwater. And even then it was based on targeting, you know, low income families. So I think I started to make the connections between what we were experiencing on like a day to day and the regulations and the policy and the legal infrastructure behind it. So all capitalism in your view, bad? Fundamentally, it's bad. And I think we also have to unpack what we mean by capitalism. You know, there are small business owners. We would consider that, you know, the petty bourgeoisie, does owning a small business make you bad? I don't think inherently. I think what the critique is really about 
is that you have a system that incentivizes exploiting labor as much as possible. It incentivizes getting as much profit as you can off of people as possible. So not every person who owns a business is going to do that, but the system does incentivize that. Huh. So if you are operating that way, it's, it's logical to do those things because that's how you survive in a capitalist economy. That's Malika Jabali. She's the author of It's Not You, It's Capitalism, Why It's Time to Break Up and How to Move On. Head on over to our podcast feed to find out what Malaika says about sharing the earnings from her book sales and which country she says has the best economic system. That answer may surprise you. That wraps up the first hour of the weekend edition of Bloomberg Business Week from Bloomberg Radio. Coming up in our next hour, our latest cover story on the most important launch of Elon Musk's career, except this one isn't rocket science, it's brain surgery. Don't worry, though, we're talking space travel, too. Because a new book explains what life on the red planet of Mars might actually be like and what it'll take to get there. This is Bloomberg Business Week. I'm Tim Stanovec. Stay with us. Today's top stories and global business headlines are coming up right now. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business app, and YouTube. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Plenty ahead in our second hour of the weekend edition of Bloomberg Business Week, including our sit down with Martin Hoffman. He's the CFO and co CEO of On Holdings. And he explains what makes his company's sneakers unique and why they're taking a key slice of the sports world by storm. Plus, we discuss the promise and many possible perils of mankind's ultimate mission to colonize our neighboring planet. We're going to speak with the co-author of a brand new book, A City on Mars. But first up this hour, the cover story of the latest edition of Bloomberg Businessweek magazine. It's available on newsstands now at Bloomberg.com and always on the Bloomberg Terminal. It's a story about Elon Musk, and it's also the launching pad for a new Bloomberg podcast series, Elon Inc. Each week, our team of experts will delve into the global influence of the world's richest man, spanning the likes of Tesla, SpaceX, Starlink, The Boring Company, X, and more. This week's cover story looks at another one of Musk's firms, Neuralink. The brain implant company is ready to start surgery after a key regulatory approval. The problem? It's still seeking volunteers for its first clinical trial. For more on what exactly Neuralink does and what a trial would entail, let's bring in Bloomberg Business Week features writer and acclaimed Musk biographer Ashley Vance, joining us along with Bloomberg Business Week editor Joel Weber. They joined us remotely while Carol and I were in New Orleans at the Wells Fargo Black Business Leaders Summit on Tuesday. You can't touch uh, a head, a human's head, until you know you get FDA approval. Um, which uh, Neuralink now has. So in the very near future, uh, uh, the company is going to actually start implanting uh, devices in humans. And uh, Ashley Vance has had an unprecedented uh, front row uh, as Neuralink has been developing this technology. Uh, Ashley, take us inside the company. I mean, Elon is known for doing bold things that, you know, break open whole new industries. But this is sort of a test of Elon in a whole new way now, right? It is. You know, I mean, this is a guy we've seen with SpaceX, with Tesla. You know, they've accomplished incredible things, but they've had some pretty severe bumps along the way. SpaceX blew up its first three rockets. Tesla took about a decade to figure out how to mass produce cars. And, and we're talking about brain implants here. This is something that really can't go wrong um, on the first go round. It's, it's Neuralink is one, as we point out in the story of, of now dozens upon dozens of companies that are looking to do brain implants, spinal implants, mostly to help people in pretty dire circumstances, um, paralyzed strokes, ALS, things like that. Um, so, but, you know, really, this is the start of a very exciting field. Neuralink is as ambitious as ever with Elon's companies, but uh, but has a lot on the line with this first trial. So how does Neuralink's device and approach differ from the other competitors who have a little bit of a head start? They've already had FDA approval and have been doing human implants. So what, what's going to distinguish the Neuralink approach? 
Yeah, I mean, there's a few things. The the other companies, yes, they, they're they've done amazing stuff. They're in bodies. I, I've been to Switzerland, seeing paralyzed people walking again with a spinal implant. Um, the biggest difference here is is it's full Elon. You know, this implant is more powerful than the others by about a thousand times. Um, it's it's much smaller. The other devices require you to have like a separate battery pack, a separate computing system that amplifies signals that's usually implanted in someone's body. With Neuralink, they're gonna cut a tiny hole out of somebody's skull, put have a robot do the surgery that puts these electrodes, these electronic threads into somebody's brain. And then the, the computing up. part, <laughs> the computing part, the, the battery, the, the amplifier, all of that goes into that hole in the skull and then fits flush with with your head and your skin goes over you can't even really tell you've had it and so it's wow. it's this more powerful implant it's miniaturized and it has the robot to try and turn this from like a a one-off type laboratory experiment into something that's repeatable so walk us through what the timeline looks like like where, where they are now and and what's gonna hopefully transpire for for what they're trying to accomplish yeah, so the last time I was there was just about six weeks ago in Austin, where the company is, is moving a lot of its headquarters. And so they're already, you know, thousands of people have sort of signed up to, to get this implant. And now they're going through these applications to try to find the ideal candidate, hopefully someone that's that's. It is going to be someone who's paralyzed, but is otherwise kind of young and, and overall healthy. And this could happen within the next couple of months. They've already identified a hospital in Arizona, which is where this is likely to take place. And and so it's just trying, right now they're just finding the exact right candidate for this first trial. Where, Ashley, does this kind of fall on the Elon Musk spectrum of priorities right now, given that he has SpaceX, Tesla, uh, X slash Twitter, the boring company, Neuralink, uh, nine kids. I, I think. XAI. Don't where, forget where XAI, which you know got announced over the weekend. XAI. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, this is a guy you know well, Ashley. Like, where does this fall on his list of things that he wants to do? Like, and he wants to be part of his legacy. It's pretty high up there. I mean, he, you know, all his companies always come with this. We're going to save humanity kind of trapping, and this this fits into that. When it was first presented to the public, I mean, he went straight for the AI sci-fi. We're going to download Spanish and Kung Fu into our brains. And, and this, this was going to be for everybody. Billions of people would get this <laughs> implant. Um, you know, it's much clearer now that for the foreseeable future, this is to help people in, in sort of dire circumstances. And so he takes that mission pretty seriously. It's interesting. He is not at Neuralink on anything like a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, he shows up, in my experience, like once a month and, and gets these kind of debriefs on mm. what's going on. And the company's essentially run by like a triumvirate of, of people. But you think of people, right, who don't have that ability and are paralyzed. If they could potentially have that capability going forward, that's pretty dramatic and life-changing. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, just to make it clear, I mean, the initial goal with this, right, is to to be able to think words that then go into a text message or a, a WhatsApp message. So you're communicating with your loved ones, you're communicating about your wants and needs and, and, and with the outside world. And the other goal is, is to be able to move a cursor around a computer screen in a very fluid fashion. And, and, you know, as any of us can imagine, I mean, just having access to a computer unlocks you know so many things that you can do and so um i mean this is it it is like borderline miraculous type technology so to that end what are the sort of the use cases that the company sees the implant being able to to solve in the in the short term and then a longer term and like how big of a growth pattern could they see based on the amount of interest they've had from from people who have said that they're willing to get an implant yeah, you know, in the short term, Neuralink is building off like decades of research here. So people have had the ability to think a couple words at a time to click yes or no on a screen. But with this extra horsepower, you know, they want it to be where you're you're thinking words almost as fast as as one of us could type um, on a computer today. So that's kind of the near term goal, wow. being able to navigate on the screen. They also have a spinal implant that they're working on that would be paired 
with his brain implant. And the goal there is to restore movement in limbs and also feeling in, in limbs where you, you kind of short circuit or, or create a circuit really between your spine and, and the brain. And from there, I mean, it moves, you know, I can talk about very futuristic stuff. It would be far off, but it's things like improving your hearing, improving your sight and, and kind of, you know, just anything that your, your brain controls, which is a lot. <laughs> How, how promising, Ashley, is this? I mean, are we going to start seeing, in, in your estimation, in your opinion, will we start seeing the big healthcare companies uh, try to get their hands on this type of technology? You know, if you look at it, it, the traditional device makers that do things like deep brain simulation for epilepsy and things like that, it's been a very, very slow moving field where a device gets made, comes out of a research laboratory and hardly gets advanced mm -hmm. at, at Things have totally changed, though. I mean, Neuralink, again, is one of at least 36 other companies working on, on products in this field. So this thing, this whole field has moved from academia to hundreds upon hundreds of millions of dollars coming in from venture capitalists. And so I try not to get people's hopes up too much because we don't really know exactly how this is going to play out, if the products are going to live up to, to their potential. But there's such an explosion of interest here that, and in my experience of seeing people with the spinal implants um you know it's encouraging i mean this is even even in the limited forms of the technology right now it's it's life changing for people who get these implants and so so for anyone who are close to the hype it will be a dramatic next 10 or 15 years that was bloomberg business week features writer ashley vance and business week editor joel weber on this week's cover story you're listening to bloomberg business week Coming up, in addition to outfitting your brain with computer chips, Elon Musk also likes the idea of putting human beings on Mars and having them stay a while. And though he may one day build the hardware to get us there, plenty of challenges will remain. I think he's famously said that, you know, once once the rockets have been figured out, the rest is going to be easy. But I think the whole point of our book is that hmm. rockets are one hard part, but there's a lot of other hard parts. Kelly Wienersmith is the co-author of A City on Mars. She joins us on the other side. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern. Listen on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. Well, more than a half a century after Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, another space race is definitely heating up. We talk about it all the time. This time, it's about the promising new frontier for us. Um, Earthlings. That's you and me. Mars? Um, is it? <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so NASA's got a rover up there. Elon Musk is trying to get SpaceX's Starship rocket up to snuff with the ultimate goal of getting people to Mars. But, Carol, the question rem remains, is it actually a good idea for us even to be thinking about going to Mars and colonizing space? I don't know. Earth is, you know, having a rough time, so we might need another place to live. Uh, anyway, this is the question of our next guest, uh, who set out to answer it in her new book. Kelly Wiener-Smith is the co-author of City on Mars, Can We Settle Space? Should We Settle Space? And Have We Really Thought This Through? She wrote this book with her husband, Zach, and she joins us on Zoom from Charlottesville, Virginia. Kelly, um, it's a subject we love to talk about. Elon Musk loves to talk about it. So many people. Uh, I'm the daughter of a rocket scientist. I love talking about this stuff. Um, tell us about this book, what you set out to do with your husband, Zach. Well, so after writing our first book together, we thought that space settlements might be a near-term near possibility, something that might happen in our lifetimes. And so we set out to write the guide for what the next couple decades are going to be like as we become a multiplanetary species. And after four years of research, we essentially determined that we are not ready to take this on yet. We don't know enough about a lot of different topics. I'm happy to get into them. Uh, and that actually if yeah. we rush into it, there could be a lot of problems. What, what do you, okay, so talk to me about the idea, like the time frames that you're thinking of. If it happens in our lifetimes, I think that might be a problem. So, for example, we don't know nearly enough about how space impacts the human body. It turns out data from the International Space Station don't tell us what we need to know about humans living on Mars. So I think if we sent them there, there could be a lot of ethical problems, especially if they started making families and, you know, exposing children to these environments that we don't understand very well sounds, uh, sounds like a problem. And as you mentioned, there might be a race with China starting. Okay, so hmm, let's think about some of the challenges that, that we're not talking about just like, you know, logistical things like actually having families. We're talking about things that are pretty serious. Like, okay, once you get there, how do you get back? Yeah, we're talking about poop food and closing the loop. Yeah, you said it, Carol. That's, that's <laughs> what I really wanted to get to. Um, okay, so just go for it. Carol's fault. Sorry. 
so closed loop ecosystems. Basically, if you're going to be living on Mars, it's going to be really expensive to get resources to you from Earth. And for a long time, it's going to be really hard to extract resources from Mars. And Mars is a two year trip there and back. It's six months to get there. And then you're stuck there for a while until Earth sort of comes back around again. And then it's six months to get home. So you need to have a system that does not break for at least two years and ideally recycles things. And we just do not have that technology figured out yet. There was Biosphere 2, which is sort of well known as being a bit of a catastrophe. Uh, and then the like right now we've got facilities in China, for example, that try to run these experiments. And in a recent round, they had to swap out two big guys for two smaller females because they weren't making enough oxygen. That's where we are right now. If that happened on Mars, that would be death instead of just swapping out crew members. Do you think we're actually like, is Elon Musk the guy who's going to do this hmm. after doing all this research? Is, is he the one who's going to be able to do this? I hope not. So I, I have to admit, I am very impressed with what Elon Musk has done with SpaceX and what and what he's done with Tesla. And I am coming to you right now from a Starlink connection. And so I, I love his projects. Cool. I, I don't think that he's the best person to lead us into becoming a multiplanetary species, but I'm not that worried about it because I think his timelines are way off. He's, I think he's famously said that, you know, once, once the rockets have been figured out, the rest is going to be easy. But I think the whole point of our book is that Rockets are one hard part, but there's a lot of other hard parts from figuring out, you know, the biology to building the habitats that are self-sustaining to figure out the geopolitical hurdles that stand in our way. There, there's a lot more than just rockets. And so I, I don't think Mars is going to be leading or Musk is going to be leading us out there uh, in our lifetimes. Hey, Kelly, you have fun with this in the book, you and your husband. I mean, you get a PhD in ecology. You are a faculty member in the biosciences department at Rice Universities. Um, so you're a seri you've got a serious side, but you have fun with this. Why was it important to lay this out? Is it because people are focusing too much time, money, and effort on this when maybe it doesn't quite make sense yet or may never? Well... Well, so, I mean, we, we started the book thinking that it maybe did make sense, but the more research we did, the more we discovered that there's a lot of a lot of topics that aren't getting, you know, for enough airtime and enough at of people's attention. And the topics, you know, maybe don't sound as exciting as rockets and rocket science. And they're just sort of like boring long term work that needs to be done to try to understand things like how partial gravity impacts bone development across, you know, the course of a lifetime. Uh, and we decided that we wanted to be funny in this book because we wanted to get really deep into the details. So for example, there's five chapters on international law as it pertains to space. And uh, when we pitched that to our <laughs> editor, she's like, I don't know that the general public is dying for five chapters on international law. So you better make it funny. Uh, and so we tried to do that. Okay, so when you're when you're thinking about what life actually look like, looks like on, on other planets, is it something that humans should actually pursue if the time frame actually gives us enough time or, or should we focus on, I don't know, making the most of the earth that we've got. Mm -hmm. So I think that space is not going to be a near-term solution for any of the problems that we have here on Earth. So, you know, for example, folks like Bezos argue that we should move all of our heavy industry to space so that we're not polluting Earth anymore. And maybe we can, you know, zone Earth as light residential. We'll move a bunch of people up to space too. I think the numbers just don't work out for stuff like that. So, you know, if you think about moving humans off the planet to take care of population growth issues, you have to move 220,000 people to space every day. I don't know where you're going to get those volunteers and we don't even know how to house them. Uh, so I think any problem Elon's that we're likely to... He's, he's looking for volunteers and I think he'll get a lot. I don't know if he's going to get that many. Uh, and, and again, we don't have anywhere to put them because we don't know how to keep that many people alive in space. Um, but if you're interested in a backup for humanity, I think a long-term plan B could be good. So, you know, if you start the settlement on Mars now... Many generations from now, it might be self-sustaining. And if you like humans, which I do, then it might be good to have a backup in case something happens on Earth, but it's not going to save us anytime soon. Kelly, one thing I would argue, though, is that many would say that the race to put a man on the moon led to lots of innovation. Um, Tang. <laughs> Velcro. I know you're going to go there. No, but some really, really important developments, no, right? It really kind of brought mm -hmm. nations together, scientists together on a on a single mission. But it led to so much, uh, many offshoots off of that. Wouldn't similarly the pursuit of Mars maybe lead to that as well? And it's a good kind of thing to focus on and have a goal of, as difficult as it may be. 
Yeah, so I, I I think that's a an interesting point. But so you know, you talked about countries being brought together by the Apollo program, but the Apollo program was really fueled by a rift between the Soviet Union and the United States. JFK was uh, sort of famously not even actually that interested in space, but it was a very clear thing that we could do to beat the Soviets. And, you know, it, it's a military prestige thing. The rockets that you're sending those humans to space in could also be delivering, you know, missiles. And so I think a lot of times going to space is not necessarily about bringing people together and the new technologies. Historically, it has also been about trying to show up our enemies. And that might be what drives us to Mars or to the moon again. You know, competition with China is heating up at the moment. Uh, and I think we should, mm. you know, yeah, yes, it might drive innovation, and that's exciting, but we need to weigh that against, you know, concerns with how this sort of it, this conflict might, uh, you know, spark problems down on Earth. But yes, you know, you might get some new technologies, but there's about. other things you could invest in to get these new technologies, too. That's Kelly Weiner smith She's the co-author of A City on Mars. Can we settle space? Should we settle space? And have we really thought this through? She wrote the book with her husband, Zach, and that book just out this week. Still to come on Bloomberg Business Week, we come back from the cosmos and examine a company doing big things here on Earth by keeping our feet comfortably on the ground. On holding CFO and co-CEO Martin Hoffman on the shoemaker's success and unusual business model. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business app, and YouTube. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Well, on the tennis court, the shoes grace the feet of U.S. Open semifinalist Ben Shelton. The company is also working with world number one Iga Swiatek to develop the perfect custom shoe for her. And of course, the tennis legend Roger Federer has invested in the company. And the company, by the way, the ADRs, the church traded here in the U.S., Carol, they're up nearly 70% so far this year. You can hear a lot and see a lot about uh, the company and uh, its chief financial officer. It's all in a new edition of uh, Chief Future Officer on uh, Bloomberg Television that has aired. Um, we're talking about uh, On Holding, uh, the Switzerland-based parent company of On Shoes. And we've got with us here Martin Hoffman. He's chief financial officer. He's also co-CEO of On Holdings, which is really kind of fascinating. You guys work around the world. How would you describe kind of the business environment and um, the job market for you guys? Is it easy to get the wor workers that you need? I mean, generally, the business is very good. So demand remains very high. Um, of course, it's not on record highs, but uh, we bring out a lot of innovation, a lot of new products in all the different categories. So from running, uh, I spoke about tennis, um, outdoor, and then also every day. And um, finding people is... Um, is is easy and hard so it's it's hard to find the right people uh, we we really pay a lot of attention on culture because that's super important for us at the same time uh, this year we we had about 400 people uh, for that we get about 40,000 applications oh my gosh. Um, so we can be very selective yeah. um, which makes it easier to to find are, the right ones. where are those are those where are those jobs available where are you hiring those people so we are a global company, um, so our, our team sits around the world. Um, of course, Zurich is the biggest office, um, so we have about 2,000 people now. 700 of those are in, in Zurich. Uh, Berlin is a big hub for us, especially on, on the, the technology side. Uh, Portland is our big U.S. office. Why are um, all the shoe companies in Portland? <laughs> yeah. It's, I uh, mean, the, okay, Adidas is there, Nike's there. <laughs> well, what, the, what is the that? Silicon Valley of the sports <laughs> is, industry. Is it? Yeah, yeah. But for us, it, uh, is it... Is it... But are you there because people who've worked in the industry, you want them to come work for you and, you know, they They're have there. the experience there? <laughs> no, it's actually... It, it was more coincidence. So our first uh, sales director in the U.S. He lived in Portland, uh, so that's why we started there. Um, we thought, yeah, we tap into the pool of uh, of the industry, but I think our first twenty hires were not from the industry, which was actually quite good because yeah. it helped us to do things differently and to disrupt. Um, uh, of course, now is, this is this is changing. I had the pleasure to live there for two years. When we started the brand, I moved over and uh, helped building it. It's a great city. So yeah, really it's a great city. It, yeah. well, how, how do you guys? I mean, you guys have a very distinct approach, and you talk about innovation. And I feel like it's a, it's a big industry. It's a competitive industry. There's a fair amount of entrance in it. Um, talk to for those who might not be familiar about how you guys distinguish yourselves from the rest. So. Um, 
if you see the, the shoes, many of the shoes have the, the holes in the outsole, which is one of the, the obvious uh, design marks that we, that we have. And this allows us to um, really engineer how the, the, the sole and the shoe behaves. Um, so it's not just the material that we use, it's also the shape and the size of the, of the holes. And, 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 and from that we developed the whole concept, uh, including the, the speed board that in, is in the shoe, but then also of course the materials, it's a lot about sustainability, um, and, and then always combining design and performance uh, with sustainability is super important for us. Do you get your shoe on an athlete and noticed, do you, you see the de direct connection in terms of sales and the impact that that has on the brand? Yeah, we, we, we call this the strategy that we have there is lightning and rain. Um, <laughs> like so lightning is really all about the, the yeah, making, making it strike and allowing those athletes to perform on the highest level. Um, but then it, it, of course, the goal is that the everyday runner also recognizes that and uh, wears the shoes. Um, it's not the same shoe. It needs to, it needs to perform differently. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, clearly we see, we see it and this is why we invest in that. We have built our own athlete team, which is called On Athletic Club. Um, and we have seen so many great results this year. And the same is happening in, in tennis. Um, so, yeah. of course, Ben Shelton uh, being in the semifinals in, in the US Open was such a big moment. Now he won his first ATP uh, in, in, uh, in Tokyo. Ika Swiatek uh, won again in, in Beijing. So it's, it's just amazing. Uh, yeah, Carol and I actually got to go to the US Open yeah. this year. We broadcast Watch. from there each year, and it was, it was great to see, especially the young Americans, make cool. such yeah. a mark yeah. this year. Uh, okay, so uh, the manufacturing process for the shoes. Uh, where are the shoes made? Vietnam? Switzerland? Yeah, so all the shoes are developed in Switzerland. Um, so we have a big development team there. Um, production is predominantly in, in Vietnam for footwear. Um, for, for apparel, we also have, have parts in, in Europe, uh, parts in China. Um, but but really, Vietnam has developed the capabilities to de to, to manufacture the best uh, high performing footwear in in the world, and so that's why we are there. Do you have to have a do you have a contract manufacturer there? Is that how it works, or do you guys have to build your own facility? No, we, we work with uh, with factory partners, uh, so we don't run our own factories. We have our own people in the factory to to mm -hmm. make sure that the quality is there and, and really translating the technology into into manufacturing. Um, but but it's a, it's quite a complex process. So I mean, a shoe goes through almost 250 hands before it's it's done. So there are a lot of, of pieces in the shoe, um, and and so that's you, you need to have uh, good partners, and we have those, um, and they invest with us also in um, sustainable manufacturing. Uh, you know how can you how can you reduce the the emission of of the of the manufacturing itself? That's really part Very of the important. culture. I know you know. The idea of the athlete, right? Because the company was, for, you know, created. So that is a big part of your culture. But sustainability is too. And uh, talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, it's um, it's like this uh, the third pillar of our DNA. Um, yeah. So I said it: performance, design, sustainability. Those are the, the three things. Um, it's 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 at the heart of what we do. Um, we have a very young team, so it comes very natural from from the inside. And um, for us, it's it's all about. Uh, Developing shoes that are made for circularity. Yeah. I think this is the big, the big goal of the of the industry. Tens, Explain what circular. Yeah. Well, and the subscription service, right? Kind of e exactly. Makes and we, that I mean, we created a, the first shoe that is fully circular, uh, yeah. made out of castor bean. Um, so it's also not uh, uh, actually fuel based, and. Um, and uh, yeah, so we, we said this is a shoe that you should never own. So we only made it available in a subscription model. So you, you rent it, uh, you pay a monthly fee, uh, you use the shoe, and when you think the shoe is, uh, is, is ready to be returned, then uh, we take it back and send a new pair. And uh, this is the beginning of a journey for us. Um, we, we will be expanding the technology into, into more models. Um, Another angle that we had is uh, what we call clean cloud. is actually using uh, carbon from, from the air um, mm -hmm. and, and making a shoe out of that. And, and here we're actually much faster in, in bringing that into, into mass market in, um, in, the, in the nearer future. Do you, oh, I'm sorry. Do you ever see that you could go fully subscription yeah. w with, uh, with the shoes and nobody would buy these shoes? I, th I think uh, you need to offer different uh, business models with your with your uh, s s 
with your sustainable products. Um, so I think in the end, the goal is that as many people as possible buy the products and buy sustainable products, right? You don't want to restrict this by, by a model, um, but at the same time, you also want to encourage the customer to return the product and um, so this is this is where we spend a lot of energy and our our cyclone program gives us so many insights into how the customer reacts and what does it take for them to return it um, and and it's also such an incredible moment in the life cycle of the of the relationship with the customer because it, it's clear indication i need a new pair so you want to uh, you want to engage with the customer then how many people are doing that right now and it's it's kind of a trial right right now but how many people are doing the subscriptions so we are at about uh, 30,000 subscriptions at the moment. That's Martin Hoffman. He's the chief financial officer and co-CEO of On Holdings. He joined me and Carolyn's studio ahead of his appearance in the New York City Marathon last Sunday. By the way, Martin completed it in just under three hours and 41 minutes. You can hear more about the strategy at On and the company's omni-channel approach. Just head on over to our podcast feed. And of course, Martin is the subject of the latest edition of Chief Future Officer on Bloomberg, you can view that entire program on our YouTube page. You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Coming up, sustainability the old fashioned way. When we look at what's really happening with recycling today, we see a huge opportunity for improvement. We speak with Keith Harrison, founder and CEO of the Recycling Partnership, when we return. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern. Listen on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. Well, the numbers, Carol, are not pretty. Less than a quarter of the 292.4 million tons of municipal solid waste, read trash, yeah. that was generated back in 2018 was recycled. That's according to the latest figures from the U.S. EPA. Actually, it's kind of more than I thought it would be. Yeah, and our next guest actually thinks we could do a lot better. Keith Harrison is the founder and CEO of the Recycling Partnership. It's an industry-funded nonprofit that advocates for improving recycling infrastructure and accessibility. The Recycling Partnership says that over the last eight years, it's diverted 770 million pounds of new recyclables from landfills, which has avoided more than 670,000 metric tons of greenhouse gases. And uh, Keith joins us on Zoom from Washington, D.C. That's legit. That's a lot. Of, a lot, uh, a lot like of a greenhouse lot. gases that have been uh, avoided. Keith, thanks so much for, for joining us. I love talking about recycling because I think that there are so Is many... you're composting now? I'm composting, got the garbage disposal too, uh, separating, you know, here in New York, we got to separate everything into, you know, it's not single stream. Um, <laughs> but one thing that Carol and I were surprised to learn recently is specifically about plastics and to what extent plastics are not actually recyclable. Because a lot of people have this misconception that if they recycle it, um, then it just gets reused and made into something else, which is beautiful. And if we see that thing on the bottom, that like circular yeah, just or throw that it in the triangle, recycling bin. we think, okay, it's going to get Who cares about the number in there? Exactly. Well, yeah, you know what? Uh, there's been a lot of, recycling has been in the news a lot lately. And some of the stories are really depressing. And I mm -hmm. want to start with the story of hope that it's not working exactly as we need it to, but we can fix this sucker. And then, uh, that, then we'll have something else to talk about on the other side. So when we look at what's really happening with recycling today. We see a huge opportunity for improvement. We see that seven out of 10 cardboard boxes end up in the trash. That's a, very similar to seven out of 10 PET bottles and glass bottles also end up in the trash. Is that fixable? Yes, what happens when we do? Even more carbon savings as you outlined. We talk a lot about trash here. You <laughs> know, Carol talks a lot of trash. That's what happens. <laughs> I do that too. Sorry. Guilty as charged. Um, no, but I do wonder about, um, you know, the impact of landfills and garbage. Just remind everybody about the impact that they have on the environment. Yes. Uh, landfills are purposely made to keep out air and sun and rain. We purposely cap them, we encapsulate them actually in plastic to keep things from breaking down. Because when they break down without air, light, and rain, uh, it creates methane. That anaerobic state inside of a landfill creates methane. However, 
Well, although the intent is to prevent things from breaking down, they still do. And in fact, landfills are one of the biggest emitters of landfill of methane, which is one of our, our strongest and most potent greenhouse gases. So we should all be so, composting is what you're saying. There, back to the compost yeah. rate. Yeah, actually, food waste is the EPA just released a really good report about the role of food waste and organics. So banana peels and and your yard tripping trimmings, what happens when those in land in a landfill? But it's also, you know, things that naturally break down like fiber, paper products and things like that. So we have to be really careful uh, before we casually toss something into a landfill because it is directly connected to the climate. That was Keith Harrison, founder and CEO of the Recycling Partnership. More from Keith on the impact of policy and helping us generate less waste can be found on our podcast feed. And that wraps up the weekend edition of Bloomberg Business Week from Bloomberg Radio. Thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to tune in to Bloomberg Business Week Monday through Friday starting at 3 p.m. Wall Street time on Bloomberg Radio. And check out our new channel on SiriusXM. It's channel 121. You can also watch our daily broadcast on YouTube. Just search Bloomberg Global News. And we're simulcast on Bloomberg Originals, available at Bloomberg.com slash originals and streaming platforms like Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Samsung TV Plus, and more. Find our Bloomberg Business Week podcast at Bloomberg.com, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. And the latest edition of the magazine is available on newsstands now at Bloomberg.com and always on the Bloomberg Terminal. Have a good and safe weekend, everyone. For Carol Masser, I'm Tim Stanovic. Stay with us. Today's top stories and global business headlines are coming up right now. This is the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, TuneIn, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.